Thank you, Seth, and good morning. It's good to be with all of you and to be able to look at this great text of Scripture that we will consider this morning, John chapter 16, verses 16 through 24. We are in what is called the Upper Room Discourse or the Farewell Discourse. The Lord is giving final words to His disciples and counseling them on things they need to be prepared for the difficult times that will be ahead of them. So we begin with verse 16 of chapter 16. A little while and you will no longer see me, and again a little while and you will see me. Some of his disciples then said to one another, what is this thing he is telling us? A little while and you will not see me, and again a little while, and you will see me, and because I go to the Father. So they were saying, what is this that he says? A little while. We do not know what he's talking about. Jesus knew that they wished to question him, and he said to them, are you deliberating together about this, that I said a little while, and you will not see me, and again a little while, And you will see me, truly, truly, I say to you, that you will weep and lament, but the world will rejoice. You will grieve, but your grief will be turned into joy. Whenever a woman is in labor, she has pain, because her hour has come. But when she gives birth to the child, she no longer remembers the anguish, because of the joy that a child has been born into the world. Therefore, you too have grief now, but I will see you again, and your heart will rejoice, and no one will take your joy away from you. In that day, you will not question me about anything. Truly, truly, I say to you, if you ask the Father for anything in my name, he will give it to you. Until now, you have asked for nothing in my name. Ask and you will receive, so that your joy may be made full. May the Lord bless this reading of his word, and bless our time of studying it together. Let's bow together in prayer. Roger Engel was a writer and editor for The New Yorker. He may be best known for his books on baseball. In a letter to a friend, he wrote this about the sport. I think fans still don't have any notion of how hard big league baseball really is. How the season gets to you. Other sports beat you up. This one happens every day and it grinds you down. It is by far the hardest sport to play at a high level. So it's a game but it's also a grind. And that, I think, is a fair description of the Christian life when it's lived at a high level. Paul described it in sports terms, running, wrestling, boxing. It's a joyful life, the only truly joyful life. It's a meaningful life, it's the full life, it's the abundant life, the truly good life. We are saved from eternal doom forever. We are children and sons of God now. There's no greater blessing. But we live in a lost world. And there's the rub. That's the problem. The world doesn't hate us. It hates Christ and the light and the gospel of grace alone. If we stay away from that, the world's fine with us. But when we shine as lights, the world will oppose us fiercely. And since the Christian life, like baseball, happens every day, it can begin to grind a saint down. After all, we are just dust. It seems... The Lord's disciples didn't have any notion of that, of how hard their lives would be as apostles. And so the Lord spent time in the upper room on this subject of what life would be like 
the sorrow that they would have at the end of chapter 16. He told them, in the world you have tribulation. And that would begin very soon. Sooner than they knew, soldiers would come in a few hours. They would arrest Christ. The Jews would try Him. The Romans would crucify Him. And He would be buried. A storm was coming, and He now prepares them for it. He said, a little while, and you will no longer see Me. And again, a little while, and you will see Me. The Lord's words, a little while, are a reference to His burial. Now, there have been different interpretations of that. People have taken that differently as, say, a reference to the period between His ascension and the second coming or the period before Pentecost. But I think it is better to understand the words a little while as a reference to the time between the Lord's death and resurrection. In verse 20, He said, Truly, truly, I say to you, that you will weep and lament, but the world will rejoice. You will grieve, but your grief will be turned into joy. This scene of the disciples weeping and mourning while the world rejoiced fits with that period of time when the Lord was in the grave. And secondly, the promise that their grief would be turned to joy And they would uh, see him after a little while fits well with the resurrection. In chapter 20, Mary is at the tomb and she's weeping. When she saw him, she rejoiced. And later in that chapter, in verse 20, John wrote that the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. So the language here and the circumstances described seem to agree best with Jesus' death and resurrection and the sorrow the disciples experienced then. But I think we can see in their experience an example of our own. We have sorrow as they did. We go through dark valleys, but their sorrow was only for a little while. And there is a great promise in those words, a little while, for the Christian today, as for the disciples then. Because while sorrow is certain, it's only for a period of time. It's not forever. David wrote in Psalm 30, verse 5, Weeping may last for the night, but a shout of joy comes in the morning, in a little while. That's the promise we have today. So the words a little while are great words. But for the disciples, they were confusing words, and they set off a discussion among them. What is this thing he is telling us? A little while, and you will not see me. And again, a little while, and you will see me. And because I go to the Father, they knew he was leaving, but they hadn't figured out the different returns that he was speaking of and would make. He he told them that he was going to the Father. Now he was saying he would come, that they would see him again in a little while. The goings and comings perplex them. The Swiss commentator Frederick Godet gave a helpful explanation of their problem. He wrote, where for us all is clear, for them all was mysterious. If Jesus wished to found the messianic kingdom, why go away? If he does not wish it, why return? Well, that was their discussion. The Lord heard all of this and spoke to them, but he he really didn't answer their question, not directly. Instead, he responded to their need. They would learn the meaning of his his words soon enough. What they needed at that moment was preparation for the crisis that they were about to have. They needed some perspective. So the Lord told them of the grief that they would soon have, but then assured them that they would pass through it. He promised them that there was joy beyond the sorrow. That's the way it is in the Christian life. As we grow, we meet difficulties. 
It may be truth that challenges what we believe. It may be a text of scripture which we find difficult to interpret. It may be a, a prolonged painful experience that, that we don't understand. Learning God's Word takes time, it takes effort. Growing in truth and in a mature relationship with the Lord is a long, lifelong process. The most seasoned saints sometimes find themselves in over their heads and, and feel abandoned by God. David wrote in, in Psalm 42, All your breakers and your waves have rolled over me. The trials come from the world's opposition, but also from physical ailment or personal loss or from God's work in our lives to refine our faith and bring about maturity. Well, people can become perplexed and they can feel ground down. But there is purpose in all of it. There will always be much to learn. None of us has arrived. And so the Lord never stops teaching us, either through trials or the struggles of life or study and prayer. Sometimes He does give us the answers to our questions, but oftentimes He does not. Not immediately or not even in this life. But He gives us encouragement that all will be well. He did that for His disciples in verse 20. Truly, truly, I say to you that you will weep and lament, but the world will rejoice. You will grieve, but your grief will be turned into joy. Their sorrow was due largely to their ignorance about His death, though not completely. Their grief would be a natural response to the personal loss they would have of the Lord going away, the Lord being crucified. And any one of us would have been grieved if we had witnessed the pain and the shame that the Lord suffered on the cross, especially knowing that it was due to our sin. He suffered because of us. Still, true as that is, ignorance was the main reason for their sorrow. They had not comprehended the reason for his death and the necessity of it. And so they were overwhelmed when it happened. We see that on the Emmaus Road when the resurrected Jesus walked unrecognized with two grieving disciples who told him, we were hoping it was he who was going to redeem Israel. They didn't realize that he had done that. So he corrected them and said, Oh, foolish men and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. All of this was foretold in the Old Testament, all through the Old Testament. Psalm 16 and Isaiah 53 and other passages. Psalm 22, Zechariah chapter 13. <clears throat> Just to name a few, a few, but certainly enough to say that they should have known. That's the Lord's rebuke, O oh, foolish men. <clears throat> As a result of not knowing the Scriptures, they were unprepared for the cross. As a result, when it happened, their hopes were shattered. And they wonder if they might not have been part of a losing cause, a lost cause. It's all over. Well, that's the reason the Jewish leaders rejoiced. They were finally finished with this one, this, this charismatic man who they thought threatened their positions. And Pilate was relieved because a political problem was off his hands. He mocked the Jews, if not Jesus, with the sign that he placed at the top of the cross. The priests hurled insults at him, and the disciples went into hiding. So we can understand their disappointment and confusion. It seemed that the enemy had triumphed. The enemy thought that it had triumphed. Satan thought that he had triumphed. So the world rejoiced and the disciples wept. But 
there was ignorance on both sides. Because what happened was altogether God's plan and the fulfillment of prophecy. The Lord knew that. He, as, he, as He forewarned the disciples, and He knew why He came. And so He reassured them that though a, 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 in a few hours they would weep, they would pass through that sorrow and they would rejoice. He said, your sorrow will be turned to joy. Notice, not replaced by joy, but turned into joy because that very cause of their sorrow would be the cause of their joy. And in verse 21, the Lord illustrates that from childbirth. Whenever a woman is in labor, she has pain because her hour has come. But when she gives birth to the child... She's no longer, she no longer remembers the anguish because of the joy that a child has been born into the world. The very thing that caused a woman suffering gives her joy, the son or daughter she bears. My wife has told me that uh, while labor was long and hard, and I was no help <laughs> both times, uh, the happiest moments of her life came afterward when she had uh, our daughters there with her in the hospital, one and then a few years later another. Yeah, that's right. Not her wedding day, but uh, <laughs> time with her daughters, my daughters too, uh, were happy moments. Well, the point is joy eclipsed the pain. It would be the same for the disciples. Christ would, would come forth, born as it were from the grave, the glorified Savior who delivered them and us from sin, death, and the devil to give them life and the Holy Spirit. It would be one of the happiest moments of their life. That's the assurance the Lord gave them. Therefore, you too have grief now, but I will see you again, and your heart will rejoice. Read through the New Testament, and you will see that the cross of Christ is never referred to as sorrow. Now, we do see sorrow here in this passage, and we see sorrow in, in the Gospels, but that is an account of their feelings historically. But after the resurrection... The cross is never considered a cause of sorrow, but only a cause of joy. The apostles gloried in the cross of Christ. Paul boasted in it. The reason he boasted is the and the cross is obvious. Without it, salvation would be impossible. But by his sacrifice, he not only made it possible, he accomplished it. Atonement was made. God's justice was satisfied. Jesus took all of our sins upon Himself, the sins of His people, and as the prophet Micah put it, cast them all into the depths of the sea. That's something to rejoice about. Through His death, He took away all our guilt, made us right with God, and then He came to them again, alive from the dead, resurrected. That's reason to rejoice because they had him back with them glorified. But they would also rejoice because it meant that the Father accepted the Son's sacrifice and therefore accepted them. When he said in verse 22, I will see you again, he knew what, that he would be resurrected that his sacrifice would be effective and acceptable to God, and that, that they would be saved forever. That's what the cross did. That was the reason Jesus had to leave them in order to save his people. And because he saved them, he could say, I will see you again. There would be reunion. That's why, again, 
Paul would say in Galatians chapter 6, verse 14, May it never be that I would boast, except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, through which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. By the grace of God, Saul of Tarsus was snatched from the flames and made into a new person, into the Apostle Paul. The world was crucified to him. It died to him. He understood what John would later write in 1 John chapter 2, verse 17. The world is passing away and also its lusts. The world right now, as we speak, is fading. It's on the way out. It's a bad investment. It had no more appeal to the Apostle Paul than a dead corpse on a cross did. But, when the world died to Paul, Paul died to the world. It no longer had any use for him. He was something of an alien in the world. It, it, it considered him a fool and treated him like refuse, trash. In 1 Corinthians 4, he wrote of that. We have become the scum of the world, the dregs of all things. That was the world's opinion of Paul and the apostles. Still, they didn't abandon the world. By dying to the world's system, they became more alive to the world's people and crossed continents and seas, mountains and rivers to bring the lost the light of the gospel. There have been others like that. Men of gift and privilege who turned their backs on all that the world could offer in order to follow the way of the cross and bless the world. Men like William Tyndale, a brilliant man whose ambition was to translate the Bible into English so that an English plowboy could know more of the Scriptures than he did. He labored to bring the Word of God to the people of England. But the king didn't want that. The king hated that. So Tyndale was forced to work at it while fleeing his persecutors out of England and across Europe. But he's finally caught, imprisoned, and executed. His dying cry was, Lord, open the king of England's eyes. He was dead to the world, but he loved the people of the world, and he was killed for it. The world rejects the light. It hates the light and thinks we who shine the truth of God's word out to it are fools. We are dead to it. We are like foul corpses on a cross. So, this life is full of trials and sorrow for those who take this life seriously and who live it at a high level. Live it by faith and live it to the chief end of man, that is, to the glory of God. The Lord was preparing His disciples for the sorrow that would come in the immediate future, in just a few hours, when He was arrested and taken from them. But the pattern here would also be true of their lives as apostles and for the church down through history for us today. But sorrow and tribulation are, are not all there is, far from it. In verse 22, the Lord promised the disciples joy. I will see you again and your heart will rejoice and no one will take your joy away from you. That joy is permanent. It's not joy that is dependent upon the world. The joy the world didn't give, the, the world did not give this joy to the disciples, and, and it cannot take it away from them. We, can't, we can't, cannot escape. The, the hardships of this life. The Lord is making that very plain. We can't escape them under any circumstances. We live in a fallen world. 
But that is especially true for the earnest Christian who will have trials and whose faith will be tested. And for many Christians, their losses and their griefs are very painful. But they're not without purpose. And they are not permanent. That's a fact that we take by faith. We don't look at the circumstances and gain that assurance. We have that assurance by faith in the Word of God. Example, Hebrews 12 verse 11 states that in time, the, t- the trials, the hardships that we have will yield the peaceful fruit of righteousness. Blessing will come out of that. Now, Sometimes all we can do is is take a promise like that and hold on to it in spite of the circumstances and what they seem to say to us. We hold on to the promise that the peaceful fruit of righteousness will come from it. But we're not all left defenseless against the wolves of the world or the ravages of time or the darts of the devil. God has given us prayer as a means to understanding and a means to joy. In that day, Jesus said, meaning in that day after He had risen from the dead, ascended to heaven, and given the Holy Spirit to the disciples, He says, you will question me about, you will not question me about anything. At the beginning of the passage, they were doing that. All through this discourse in the upper room, they had been confused and they were asking him questions. But he was telling them here that in the future, that would change. The Holy Spirit would be their teacher and guide. He would clear up their confusion with the understanding that he, the Holy Spirit, would give and the joy that he would give as he does for us as our teacher and guide. As we study the Bible, He explains and applies it to us. The the second word that the Lord used in this verse for ask means ask something, or rather ask for something, as in asking in prayer. Truly, truly, I say to you, if you ask the Father for anything in My name, He will give it to you. Until now you have asked for nothing in my name. Ask and you will receive so that your joy may be made full. Now that gives both the conditions for effective prayer and the scope of it. It is ask for anything and ask in Christ's name. That means a person can only approach God the Father in genuine and effective prayer through God the Son. Christ is the mediator between God and man. He is the go-between. And to pray in His name means to come to God as one who has identified with Christ. His name represents His person. And to be in His name is to be in Him. United to Him, united in Him through faith. So our access to God is based only on what Christ has done. Not on what we have done. Only on who He is, not on who we are. In and of ourselves. And further, we can only expect answers to our prayers if we are abiding in Him, meaning living in an obedient relationship with Him, living in communion with Him. Back in chapter 15, verse 7, the Lord said, If you abide in Me and My words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. It's only as the Christian lives in personal communion with the Lord that he or she thinks God's thoughts and wants His will to be done and then asks for what is appropriate and receives from Him what is good. When we pray according to His will, He hears and He answers. Now that's what Tyndale did. 
His dying cry was a prayer, Lord, open the king of England's eyes. Well, I don't know if the eyes of Henry VIII were open spiritually, if he was converted, but the Reformation took hold and it spread throughout England and Scotland. That was the real intent of his prayer. To, to bless the nation through the king or otherwise, ultimately, his prayer was that he would bless the nation through the translation of the scriptures, the word of God. And God answered that prayer. And he gives big answers. He answers a, a far more than we can ask or think, as Paul told the Ephesians. And he certainly did that there, and he does that with us. It is the God-given means, prayer is, for accomplishing his will, gaining wisdom and understanding, and the means to having joy in this life, even in the midst of trials, and trials that we can't understand. That's the reason the Lord gave for praying here, ask, and you will receive so that your joy may be made full. And are you, I can ask, experiencing this joy that is spoken of here? We all need to ask ourselves that. If not, maybe it's because we're not engaged in a consistent prayer life. I think all of us would agree that that is a discipline of life that's difficult for us so many times. We put it off to the end of the day, or we find ourselves not praying, and when we do, we're tired. And No, this is an essential thing for us to do. Throughout the Gospels, we see this. We see this in the Lord's life. He was a man of prayer. It occupied a lot of his time in the ministry. Given to prayer, he would go off by himself. He would abandon the crowds that were clamoring for him to be alone and in prayer for hours with his Father. It is what he is presently doing for us now in heaven as our great high priest. Prayer is essential for our relationship with God. Again, we read here that it is God's means for our joy. And we find that in other passages. 1 Thessalonians 5, verses 16 and 17. There Paul wrote, wrote, Rejoice always, pray without ceasing. But the ultimate reason for joy, the ground of it, is the central fact of history. The cross. That he died for our sins and was raised because he gained our justification and salvation. Because of that, every believer is fully forgiven forever and completely accepted by God. We will see Christ. We will be raised from the dead and we will share in his glory. That's our future. A glorious future. Back to baseball. In 20 friend, uh, 2010, Mark Newman invited me to the World Series, the Texas Rangers against the San Francisco Giants. I grew up listening to the World Series on the radio, then watching it in black and white, then in color. I'd never been to a game. So this was a thrill to go to the World Series. And as we approached the stadium, I felt the electricity of it. And we had great seats. Behind home plate, about 20 rows up. Great seats, not such a great game. <laughs> the Giants had a great team. They were leading the series three games to one. This was crucial. We lose it. We're out of the series. We lost it. We lost the World Series. When the last batter was at the plate, we knew what was going to happen. We knew the game was essentially over. I think he may have had two strikes on him. And so Mark said, let's go. 
I don't want to see a dog pile on the pitcher's mound. And I said, no, let's stay. I want to see the whole thing to the end. This is the World Series. And so we stayed. He reluctantly. And there was a dog pile on the pitcher's mound. Grown men playing a game, piling on one another like kids. At that moment, the pain and the fatigue from being ground down by a long season, playing every day, all of that pain and suffering was forgotten. It was turned into a frenzy of joy. That's our future. That's a picture of it. Our trials only prepare us for that. Paul told the Corinthians that momentary light affliction is producing for us an eternal weight of glory far beyond all comparison. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 17. Someday the struggles will end. We will come to Christ like victorious warriors from a fierce battle and enter glory with Him forever. The world can't give that hope. It's only in Christ. He bought us back then. He guides us now. And someday He will bring us into His glorious presence. That's our hope, and it's certain. It should give us encouragement as we go through the trials of life that we will certainly go through. But if there's someone here who doesn't know Him, who's not believed in Christ, He is our great God and Savior. And He is to be believed on. He's very God of very God who became a man, one of us, in order to die in our place, bear our guilt, suffer our punishment, so that we would escape it. All who believe in Him have done that. So, if you're here without Him, we encourage you. Come to Him. Trust in Him. When you do, you will receive the forgiveness of sin and life everlasting and the glory to come. Father, we do thank You for the great truths that we have just sung and the great truths we have read about in the Scriptures. We're secure in You. We're secure in the hand of Your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. He's paid the price for each one of us who put our faith in Him so we can never be plucked out of His hand and someday He will bring us home and bring us home into glory. We do suffer difficulties in this life, Lord. It's been described as a veil of tears. We pass through it. It's a dark valley. But we're secure in it, nevertheless. And we thank You that You have promised us joy at the end and even joy in the midst of it. We thank You for Your goodness and Your grace and what You've done for us through Christ. Lord, give us faithfulness to You that we might walk and persevere to Your glory to the end. And now, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord... Be gracious to you. The Lord lift up His countenance upon you and give you peace. In Christ's name, amen.